we're reading through the Bible. I trust that you're on track. You know, summer is a busy time, but it's also a time that we have extra time, right? Eh, maybe. Okay. So we get caught up on our reading and get the place that we know where what's happening. Some exciting things that were read this week, this past week. Great Torah study and the lesson for the week. And uh, I, I had a hard time deciding where we were going to go. We read, finished uh, uh, the first First Chronicles four through sixteen. We talked about that a little bit. We have been in Acts a few times, so we finished Acts this week from chapter 25 to the end. We're starting the book of Romans. Now, I've given you an introduction to Romans a number of times, but we may, may look at that again and, and see a little bit more about the, the book of Romans. We're reading Psalms and Proverbs, but I want you to think with me a little bit today. Uh, in the book of Acts, and we're going to pick out some specific things, and we're talking still about hearing God. Now, how do we hear God? Multiples of ways. We've been looking through the scriptures for several weeks now and looking at different people and how God has spoken to them through a great light to Saul, through a soft voice to Samuel, through angels, through, through uh, trance. Uh, Peter had a trance, it says. Through a dream to Cornelius. Multiple ways that God speaks to us. Bring that fast forward up to where we are today. And I'll remind you that God doesn't change. And God will speak to us in the same ways. He speaks to us in a soft still small, soft voice in our hearts and our spirit. We, we know the nudging of the Holy Spirit. I believe that you can sense God's presence. And I think that you can decipher when God is speaking to you. Remember, there are a few cautionary things always. God never tells us anything that would be contradictory to His Word. So we can always go to the Word and check out what God is teaching us. But what an amazing thing to be able to think about God. You know, it's very possible, highly probable, that God would speak to you now through the worship, through the time where we're lifting our voices, God's Spirit, through the concentration about God's Word, looking at it, reading it. I believe there's power in reading God's Word. That's the reason we put the the verses on the screen and we look at them together I, and I hope that you look at them in your Bible I think there's something that's powerful about having your word and having it in hand and looking at it see what God has in store for us and what he's saying to us I believe he speaks a lot more than we hear so let's listen to his voice today we're in Acts Give you a real quick kind of review, maybe just a overall umbrella cap of the simple movements of, of Acts. And we know that Acts is tied to Luke, and Luke is the writer, and Luke accompanies the book of Acts. He's along. When it says, We did this, we, it's Luke that's writing that. He's a Gentile. He's a physician. He writes uh, very detailed things. So, a beautiful opportunity for us to see, maybe from an outsider, not the apostles, what the, the Messiah had taught, what they had comprehended, and how they put it into action in their lives. Uh, the beginning of the book of Acts gives us uh, a little bit of overview, ties the books together, and jump into chapter 2 where the Holy Spirit is given. It's on the day of Pentecost, and, uh, and we're going to see how the book of Acts, the storyline goes, and in the storyline, you're going to see the feasts that are played out. Uh, if you're careful and look for them, you'll see that not long in the book of Acts, you'll find that it's the day of uh, of atonement, which would be the fall following the day of, of, uh, of Pentecost, okay? After that. 
And then you're going to see unleavened bread that comes the next year. And then you're going to see the Day of Atonement. So the, the book of Acts covers probably at least a year and a half or more. Uh, and it takes, you know, Paul's missionary journey. So we've got the beginning is the giving of the Holy Spirit. Uh, chapter 3 comes in and we change characters and we go to Peter and John. And Peter and John are so excited and we see them healing the blind, uh, the, the, the leper, the beggar, the lame black beggar. And then we see that their excitement gets them in a lot of trouble and they get put in jail. And then they are let out of jail by God. We see the story of Ananias and Sapphira and how they disappointed God and the people that they were with. We see in chapter 6 the choosing of the seven, which involved Stephen. He's introduced in chapter 6, and he's, his uh, death is in chapter 7. He's not long, very long there. He's stoned to death for preaching the word and for believing in the way. And at this time, chapter 8, we get our introduction to Saul of Tarsus. And we find that Saul is a zealous person who is a Pharisee of the Pharisees, raised in, in uh, Tarsus, in Cilicia. His dad, uh, tradition tells us, or extra-biblical writings teach us, that he was a member of the Sanhedrin at one time. Highly connected with Jerusalem. And Saul goes to Jerusalem, we know his story, and he studies with Gamaliel. He's introduced in chapter 8. The very next chapter, his life changes. Oh, Saul goes from persecuting the churches in chapter 8 to chapter 9 is his experience on the road to Damascus. And we've looked at that one and we see how God spoke to him and how it changed his life completely. So we begin to see Paul as, uh, as he begins his uh, experience with God and then he's gone. Two years or more, he's gone. During that time, we have Cornelius' vision. We have Peter's trance. We've looked at all of these. We have Peter as he goes before the council in Jerusalem and, and presents to them. Then we have Peter arrested, chapter 12, and an angel comes and delivers him from prison in the middle of the night. And we see over and over and over, we're seeing the acts of the apostles, except for it's really the acts of God for the apostles. We see God speaking to them, God changing lives, God's directing them, God sending them different places. In chapter 13 is where the whole thing turns around. And from here forward, we look at Paul and his missionary journeys and his struggle with what's going on in, uh, in his life and in the life, in the spreading of the gospel to the world. We see that he goes to the Council of Jerusalem in chapter 15. We see his Macedonian call where he's prohibited from going other places and, and he sees a vision about come to Macedonia. Uh, we see him in chapter 17 with the church at Thessalonica. We see him in chapter 18 with the church at Corinth. We see him in chapter 19 with, the, uh, with Ephesians, the church at Ephesus. We see him in chapter 20 in Macedonia and over to Greece. Chapter 21, he say, sails to Miletus. Chapter 22, he gives his defense before the Jews. Now, he is before uh, the council that has the high priest that's there. The high priest is Ananias. And you'll see if you look back and do a little bit of uh, understanding about what's happening in that time, Judaism has gotten away from where it came. 
and the Roman Empire has greatly influenced it. We have strict guidelines in the scripture about who can be priest and who can be high priest. By this time, Ananias was appointed by the Roman government. He wasn't in the bloodline. He wasn't supposed to be high priest. He's acting as high priest. Paul goes before him. There's a little debate about whether Paul knew he was a high priest or didn't know he was a high priest or just forgot he was a high priest. And there's a conflict there, and you read that this week. Uh, it's very interesting. And then we have Paul's testimony once again. Now we see the, what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. We see it a couple more times, and then here in uh, chapter 26, he gives that testimony again in front of King Agrippa. Now this is over and over and over uh, the testimony of Paul, what happened to him. Now, um, after his testimony, he makes an appeal to go uh, to Rome, to stand before Caesar. Now, uh, you back up a chapter and you find that uh, a prophet of God came to him and told him and all the people, Luke and the others that were with him, that he shouldn't go. Remember, he came and he untied Paul's belt and he tied his arms, his hands, and his feet. And he said, the owner of this belt, this is what's going to happen to you. And so everybody said, don't, don't go to Jerusalem. If you go, you're going to be arrested. You're going to be killed. Don't go to Jerusalem. And he said, I'm ready. I'm willing to go and to die. And so he did. He went to Jerusalem. And he stood before the council. He stood before the high priest. And uh, he was talking about what God had done in his life and how God had spoken to him. And the high priest had one of the guards slap him in the face. And uh, Paul's outburst there and then he apologized because he said, oh, I didn't realize that was the high priest, okay? So make your own decision. I don't know exactly what happened there. Very interesting. I'm trying to get you caught up to where we are. Paul has been arrested. He's on his way to Rome, and it's a long journey. Now, we've looked at his missionary journeys. We've looked at the maps. We've seen where he's been. He's been traveling here for a couple of years. And now he's ready and he's going to go to Rome. So we pick him up at that particular point and um, he's going to go with a Roman centurion named Julius. And Julius evidently likes Paul, gives him a lot of liberties. Now before we pick that up, let me uh, ask you a couple of questions that you can kind of let set in your mind during this time. How do we identify with the Apostle Paul? And you may say, you know, uh, there's no way, no way to compare me for me to identify with or whatever. But I want you to just think about the Apostle Paul, his life and what happened to him. And how would we today identify with that. Uh, I looked at several different points. Uh, there's one place, chapter 20, that uh, you might, some of you at least, might say that I would identify with Paul. Remember, Paul's getting ready to go on a trip, and he calls everybody together, and they have this evening meeting, and he's preaching, and it says that he just kept on preaching and kept on preaching and kept on preaching, and it just went on and on until after midnight. So you might identify me with that. Although uh, the, what was the guy's name? Eutychus? Was a young man who was sitting in the window listening to Paul. And uh, now, if you read it carefully, it's the third floor. They have a meeting room, and he's sitting in an open space. We, we think about windows as being glass, but windows are the openings. It's there, and there probably wasn't glass. And he's sitting in the window, and Paul goes on for so long that he falls asleep and falls out the window, and it kills him. Well, so far, no one has fallen out of their chair, right? And, and please be careful. If you're sitting by someone that's dozing off, we'll help them. Don't let them fall out of the chair, okay? 
We could get some seat belts, maybe. So, Paul was zealous for what he believed. And I would dare say that the majority of you years ago were zealous. You are today, I know. But, but you wanted, you had that inner challenge and drive to do what was right. You're involved in church. You went to church. You believed in God. You were zealous for your faith. Well, Paul was like that. He was zealous for God. He was so strong that he just couldn't stand anyone who would lead them astray. And he felt that Yeshua, Jesus, and the apostles were teaching heresy. And they were teaching against Judaism. And they had organized a cult called the Way. And he was so adamant that he wanted to do away with that. He was strong. He went after it. And he was so strong that he even went and beat them up. And he got permission to have some of them put in prison. Some of them, like Stephen, to be killed. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest a bunch of people for being a part of the way. When he got some new information, an encounter with God, changed his life entirely. Okay, now he's zealous for the way. Now, it was not his intent, does not appear at all that it was his intent to go and start a new religion, nor was it for the apostles. But now they had information that brought to light much of the scripture in a new way. And Paul was famous about preaching about Yeshua from the scriptures. And when we say the scriptures, we're talking about the Torah because the New Testament hadn't been written. And so he would preach about Yeshua from the Old Testament. He was zealous. So hold on to that for a little while. And, uh, and we'll come back and talk about how we relate to Paul. Now we want to pick up his journey and, uh, and it's from uh, chapter 24, 25, 26. He starts in this journey and I want to give you some background here on a map so you can kind of accompany what we're doing. So he's in Jerusalem. They actually leave from Caesarea is what it says. But the story begins with him in Jerusalem and saying goodbye to everybody. And Julius is uh, a Roman centurion. We don't know how many, how many soldiers he had with him, but a pretty good group of soldiers. And they were taking a shipload of prisoners to Rome. Okay, so we pick up in Jerusalem. We we'll put the arrow there. And you see Israel, the little small area. They leave Jerusalem and go to Caesarea. Caesarea Philippi on the Mediterranean coast. Gorgeous, gorgeous area. And that's where they set sail. Uh, they go up to Sidon. Well, that's Tyre and Sidon. It's the very tip of what was Israel at that time. And uh, the, the ship was the time of year is the, the fall and the winds were blowing and so the ship decided instead of cutting across the Mediterranean Sea and going straight across there, we're going to stay close to shore and come in to port and get supplies and just go around. So they went from Sidon around over to Myra and from Myra down to Fair Havens on the island of Crete. And we'll stop in the middle of the story in a minute and you remember where that is. It's out in the Mediterranean Ocean, a pretty good sized island, the island of Crete. 
and a lot of stuff happened there. Then they sail on across to Malta, and uh, that was really not their plan, but the storm got them. And then they go on up all, uh, to, to Neapolis, and then up to Rome. So that gives you kind of the, the journey. Now I was curious about the journey, so I got on Google Earth and looked up from Jerusalem to Rome, Italy, and it only takes three hours and 40 minutes, okay, by jet. Here's Google Earth, and you can, you can get flights from $276. I bet Paul would have loved that, right? Okay? But that's not the way Paul went. They went by sail ship, not by motorized, okay? So I wondered how far that was. So I came back and I said, give me mileage of that. If you go straight across there, it's 1,465 miles. Most of the commentaries say that Paul embarked on a 2,000 mile journey. So I would think 2,000 miles on a sailing vessel. That's a long trip. Um, you can see across there. Now their intent was to either winter at Cyprus or over on Crete. So they're leaving in the fall. They're going to be gone a month or two getting out to that area. They're going to stay in port for the winter. And when it gets warm, then they're going to head and make it all that summer to Rome. And we're not talking about a quick trip, okay? And they have a boatload of prisoners. We don't know how many, but there were quite a few. They have the crew of the boat and the centurion's soldiers that are with him all on board this ship. So let's pick it up in chapter 27, see kind of what... Uh, the scriptures have to say to us and how we can see how we identify with that. It begins in the first verse when it says, When it was decided that we were to sail to Italy, we means that Luke is going, they handed Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion named Julius of the Imperial Regiment. When we had boarded a ship of Adamaturum, and that is a place in Asia Minor. So this ship, more than likely, had delivered a cargo across from Asia Minor, and now they were headed back, so they took passengers with them back. And they're intending to sail to ports along the coast of Asia. Aristarus uh, who, who was a Macedonian of Thessalonica. Remember, Paul got the Macedonian call, went there, lots of converts. Evidently, this was a young man that had come back with them. He traveled with them. So we've got these three men, uh, two accompanying Paul. Paul being a prisoner, the others are free men, but they're going along as companions on this trip. The next day, we put in at Sidon, up the coast, and Julius treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go to his friends to receive their care. Find that interesting. Paul is a prisoner, supposedly highly guarded prisoner, especially in Jerusalem, and put him in stocks and guarded him from the other people. But Julius realizes that Paul's not a flight risk because he said, I'm ready to go and appear before Caesar. I'm going to go to, and, and God had spoken to him and told him that you're not going to die because you need to present your testimony to Caesar and you're going to go to Rome. So Paul was of what God had said and the the centurion allowed him and his friends, I suppose, to go and visit their friends that they had met in their missionary journeys. When we'd put out to sea from there, we sailed along the northern coast of Cyprus because the winds were against us. So they were going to go right on out uh, to, to the islands that are out there in, in the middle of the Mediterranean, but they couldn't because 
the winds were against them. They couldn't in a sailing vessel. You have to go along with the winds. After sailing through the open sea off Cilicia, Paul's home, you know, and Pamphylia, we reached Myra in Lycia. There, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. So they changed ships at the port there, and they're heading toward Rome, Italy. Sailing slowly for many days, you're, you're at the mercy of the wind. Now, you don't have to just go with the wind. You can sail into the wind if you catch your sails right and go a little bit this way and a little bit that way and that way and and, and it works but it's very slow sailing so they were sailing for many days with difficulty and they arrived off Snidus since the wind did not allow us to approach it we sailed along the south side of Crete that's that island uh, out in, in the Mediterranean with still more difficulty, we sailed along the coast and came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lasea. And I'll show you that map once again to kind of catch you up, okay? So they've made it from Caesarea up around what is now Turkey, Asia Minor, and over to Crete where the arrow is showing Fair Havens. But by now much time had passed and the voyage was already dangerous that means winter is coming and you don't want to try to cross these waters in the winter okay? remember they didn't have central heat and it was it was tough sailing plus the the cold bitter cold was dangerous since the day of atonement was already over so we're in the fall right Paul gave them his advice. Now, you have a, an owner of a ship and his crew who are professional sailors. You have a centurion who this evidently is his job of taking prisoners back and forth. Okay? And then Paul, this preacher, comes along and gives them his advice. Wonder how that went, right? He told them, men, I can see that this voyage is headed toward disaster and heavy loss. Not only the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. That might have raised a little bit of doubt and fear, right? But the centurion paid attention to the captain and to the owner of the ship, seems logical to me, and didn't listen to Paul. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter, the majority decided to set sail from there, hoping somehow to reach Phoenix, a harbor on Crete, facing the southwest and northwest, and to winter there. So they're going to try to make it to Crete and winter. When a gentle south wind sprang up, they thought they had achieved their purpose. They weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. But before long, a fierce wind called the Nor'easter rushed down from the island. So it's coming, pushing them away from the island. Since the ship was caught and unable to head into the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. After running under a shelter, uh, of a little island called Cauda, we were barely able to get control of the skiff. After hoisting it up, they used ropes and tackle and girded the ship, fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis. They lowered the drift anchor, and in this way, they were driven along. Because we were being severely battered by the storm, they began to jettison the cargo the next day. Now you got this pretty good sized ship with all these men on it and they're getting a little bit antsy. They're getting afraid, right? And Paul is there. 
The next line says, on the third day. Interesting comment. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. For many days, doesn't say how long, many days, neither sun nor stars appeared. And the severe storm kept raging. Finally, all hope was fading that we would be saved. Now, what do you think Paul's thinking? God told him he's got to go to Rome and that he's not going to die and he's going to go. And now all this problem of getting there. God, why would you do that? I mean, you wanted me to go and I'm willing to go. Let's go. Problem after problem after problem. Difficulty. Finally, all hope was fading that they'd be saved. Since they had been without food for a long time, they threw all the stuff over, lightened the, the ship so they could stay afloat. Paul then stood up among them and said, Time has passed, and I wish we had the inside information. So you have to kind of read between the lines. He stood up and said, You men should have followed my advice not to sail from Crete and sustain this damage and loss. You should have listened to me, right? Yeah, sure. Now, I urge you to take courage because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only the ship. Now, what is this preacher, missionary, what's he saying? And who believes him? And why should they? Right? And then he goes on in the next verse, 23 says, For last night, an angel of the God I belong to and serve stood by me and said, Don't be afraid. Now, what angels say? Don't be afraid, Paul. It is necessary for you to appear before Caesar. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. So because of you, Paul, they're all going to be spared. God is being gracious. Now, how did that come about? Angel appeared to him and spoke to him. Now, he didn't, the writer, Luke, didn't see that. Luke's just reporting what happened, right? I wondered if if Paul may have gathered his two companions and told them beforehand, look, don't be afraid. God has sent his angel and has told me we're going to be okay. I mean, if that had happened to me or to you, I think we'd been so excited we're going to tell people. Right? But Luke says, writes a story and tells what's happened. Now, he says, so take courage, men, because I believe God that it will be just the way it was told to me. So Paul's going to stand firm. How did he know to stand firm? His experiences. Right? Had Paul been in difficulties before? Had his life been threatened before? Had he been beaten nearly to death? Had he been thrown in prison? Had he been kicked out of cities? Yeah. But the angel of God came and spoke to him, and Paul believed. And he stood strong. So I ask you, how do you identify with Paul? How do you hear God? Would God send his angel to talk to you? I think he would. I don't think God has changed. 
Now let's do some comparisons between us and Paul. Paul was zealous. We could say for his denomination, for his religion. He was faithful. He attended. He studied. Carried his load. And then he met Yeshua on the road to Damascus. Changed his life. He, I'll interject it this way, he received some new information. It wasn't like, forget all of this and go to this. It's like icing on the cake. And the Messiah comes and says, didn't you see in the, the law of Moses the teaching about me? And that the Messiah must die? The whole thing, it changed his whole perspective. Now, he disappears for a couple of years. We believe he was studying, that God was teaching him, that he was talking to different people about what had happened. He was getting all this sorted out before he made some real blunders. And then he spends the rest of his life telling his story. You know what happened to me? I mean, it changed my life. I, he didn't leave the people he knew. He didn't try to start a new religion. He went to the people that were like him, zealous. And he said, you can't believe what I've discovered. It's the most exciting thing that's ever happened. I see the scripture in a total new light. I understand about Messiah. People wouldn't accept him. The Sanhedrin wanted to do away with him. The Pharisees disowned him. The Sadducees wanted to kill him. He had to, to flee from town to town. Nothing was working out right. Oh yeah, he had a lot of converts and he started lots of churches. But at home, Jerusalem particularly, it was tough. And yet God worked in him and he kept teaching him and he kept prodding him. And when he needed, God delivered. When he was in prison, God came and set him free. When he was, they were trying to stone him, God re, took him out. When he was uh, about to be shipwrecked, he sent an angel and said, yeah, the ship's going down, but you're going to be okay. Now, you read on in the story and you find out that when they get ready for the ship, it's going down, it's breaking apart, runs aground. Then the soldiers decide they're not about to let their prisoners go free because that costs them their life. So they're going to line the prisoners up and execute them. And the guys that work on the ship, they're putting the life rope boats down and they're getting out now. And the centurion has to send his soldiers and cut the ropes and get rid of the lifeboats or they wouldn't have had anybody to help them. They all would have died. Things are going bad. And God sends his angel. Now, let's turn the coin over and let's think about us. Interesting comparison, I believe. You and I, most of us, were zealous about what we believed. We read the Bible, went to church, we followed tradition, we were there. And one day, something happened. Everybody's testimony is a little bit different. But there was some new information that came along. And it changed our lives. We didn't want to start a new religion. 
we wanted those that were zealous for the faith to listen to us and be able to explain to them the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me in my faith is the new information that I've received. That the Old Testament's not done away with, that it's complementary to the New Testament. Oh, and that Shabbat is important to God and still is. He created it. He set it aside, made it holy, and it's still that way. New information changed our lives. And if you were like most of us, you wanted to tell everybody. And most of the time it fell on deaf ears. And it caused problems. And there were heartaches. And it was difficult. And there were tears shed. I see a parallel with Paul's life and with our lives. And I also can testify, and many of you can too, that when things get tough, when life gets complicated, when it looks like the ship is going down, God gives you an answer. He might send you an angel. He might use someone else. He might just speak to you in a soft voice. But when things are at their worst, we need to expect God to show up. Now, that lesson is hard to learn. But I believe that God is teaching us that, that when the adversary comes, when it's knocking on our door, when our ship is going down, God shows up. If we don't turn our backs and run, if we listen, we will see miracles. Now, this ship broke apart. All of the prisoners, all of the people who worked on the ship, all of the soldiers, all were safe and made it to shore. And the prisoners didn't escape. And the soldiers stayed in place. And by the way, they all became friends. You kind of see that. And you see how Paul gained so much liberty from that point forward. Yes, he was imprisoned, but he was very well respected. I think it attributed to the validity of what he taught. And I think as that story was told, on the tail end of the road to Damascus, where God called him, and he was faithful and did what God told him to do, and then the angel shows up and saves their life. Now, I kind of read between the lines there, but I, I can only imagine an old wooden vessel like that breaking up and sinking and, and the tragedy that that would be and for everyone to be safe. I think it was God's hand. And we have this story. Without adversity in our lives, we can't see the miracles. God doesn't have to work the miracles. But when we're down, when nothing can help except a miracle, God shows up. In a statement we looked at a few weeks ago, it says your internal joy will enable you to overcome your circumstances. Paul. No, I can't really compare myself to Paul. 
in any way. Yet I see his circumstances and what happened in his life are a parallel to what has happened in my life. Because I was zealous for the gospel. I was a missionary. I did evangelism. I studied. I went to seminary. I wanted to do what God wanted me to do. And then one day, new information came. And I began to see the scripture in a new light. And I began to understand how the old and the new works together. And I began to see the festivals and no evidence that they've been done away with. And began to see Shabbat. And no biblical evidence that I can find that says it's to be done away with. And in faith, stepping out and embracing that has brought an inner joy and a completeness that I didn't know before. I think you understand. I think you agree. What a blessing. Now, it hasn't been easy, and it's probably not going to get easy. We're working against the flow. And things may get worse. And it's possible that they could get very bad. But what we hold on to is what Paul did. He knew that God would show up just in the nick of time. Now, you see, God could have told Paul before they left Jerusalem, Paul, you're going to have a shipwreck and you're going to be okay. Don't worry about it. Sleep well. Right? But he didn't until the ship's breaking apart. Until it's out of control. And many times, your life can get out of control. So what do we do? I believe we expect God to show up. Now, he may come in a still, small voice. He may come as a bolt of lightning. He may come as an angel. He may come as a dream. He may come as, as a vision. He may come as a person speaking to you or an angel in a form of a person speaking to you. It may be you driving down the road and it just comes in your mind. But when things are at their worst, God is always at his best. And we need to be the kind of people that expect that, that watch for it. I'm afraid that I've missed God speaking to me many times because I was busy doing my thing. And I want to become more aware of God and the way He works and the way He speaks and the way He teaches, the way He provides for us and protects us. And I want to be able to see those miracles. Oh, you know, fantastic for miracles of healing and, and all these extra uh, types of miracles that, that are just... but. I think the greatest miracles are just the Holy Spirit indwelling and teaching and talking and giving comfort and giving wisdom and being a part of us. And when we get comfortable with that, and when we can have a relationship with God that's, that's so intimate and so close that we recognize His voice, I think the bigger not bigger, the other miracles are going to become more and more prevalent. I'm excited about it. I believe in adversity. We will see God at work. 
So if you've never thought about how you identify with the Apostle Paul, as you read now, we're going to read several of his books in Romans now. He's writing to the Romans. He's in Rome. He's in jail. And he's writing the book of Romans. Maybe you can see from a new light, a different standpoint of how Paul walked out his life. Very similar to you and I. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blessings you've given us. We thank you for this day. Thank you that we've come into a new understanding of who you are and what you want in our lives. I ask, Lord, that you give us wisdom, that you give us mercy, that you grant us uh, opportunities to be zealous for our faith, that you teach us how, with wisdom, to be able to share what we've learned, and that others will have open ears to hear. And much as Paul did as he shared the message, that we will have understanding of where to go and when to speak, and where not to go and when to keep our mouths shut. We ask, Lord, for that wisdom. We ask, Lord, that you bless us and that you walk with us and that you guide us every day. We pray these things in the name of our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, and say, Amen.